I'll be introducing Dr. Adrian. He's going to speak uh, on IVM, in vitro maturation of oocytes, and whether the results are comparable to standard IVF or not. Dr. Adrian is hailing all the way from Israel. He is a clinical associate professor in Opsin Gynec at the Rappaport School of Medicine at uh, Israel Institute of Technology, Haifa. He is uh, the director of the IVF unit since 1999. He has a special interest in IVM, in vitro maturation of oocytes, poor responders, PCOS, IVF outcome, and he has pioneered IVF treatment with minimal stimulation and egg donation in Israel and published heavily in these fields. He's a member of many international societies. Without much ado, I'll invite him to please uh, start his session. Thank you. And uh, I shall talk about the um, advantage or disadvantage of um, in vitro maturation comparable to standard IVF. Now, if I have a close look to the IVM versus IVF, we can say that IVM oocytes <laughs> may have potential advantages over conventional IVF. First, it is a very simple protocol with the decrease in no hormonal stimulation before oocytes retrieval and thus can lower the cost. It's a clear benefit. More importantly, the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation is entirely avoided. However, until one can say that IVM is an alternative to conventional IVF treatment, disadvantages has been weighed against the pregnancy and delivery rate, children outcome, and also possible risk. The small history. The first that actually obtained in vitro maturation was Pincus and Enzman in 1935. They were capable to <coughs> undergo spontaneous maturation in rabbits. Cha in 1991 was the first to show the IVM in human beings and succeeded to mature oocytes that he received from a C-section, just derived from the antral follicles. But just was Tromson from Australia was the first that put IVM actually firmly in the clinical realm, obtaining the first delivery for IVM of oocytes from oocytes in, in patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So what are the indications now for an IVM? First, just normal ovulatory cycle. Second, PCO or PCOS. Third, fertility preservation or patients that have hormonal contraindication and other just remote or, or, or very uh, seldom diseases. It's poor ovarian response or rescue or oocytes which have been helped, failed to mature in, in stimulated cycles as we talk in the morning. So what about natural, regular cycle? And you can see here, just, may I have a pointer, please? You can see here, actually, no, doesn't matter, it's okay. You know the results from the 1999, from 1999 of Mikkelsen from Denmark, that she actually started a natural and a normal, regular, normal uh, ovulatory women and actually, she, she obtained in 1999 about 25% pregnancy rate. And, and, and those results actually was, were performed and were obtained by other, other people for, for all around the world. In 2006, Del Canto from, from Italy actually obtained a 20.5% pregnancy, clinical pregnancy rate. And it's a very, very interesting study because he was the first actually to compare the results of IVM with ICSI and just regular in vitro fertilization. And at her just normal ovulatory cycle, the results were absolutely identical. What is more important is that in March 2004, it was impossible to use more than a maximum of three oocytes per IVF cycle, and embryo could, cannot be prezygotes uh, selected or cryopreserved. And this is a very important thing, but IVM could be the first choice of making such a program in Italy, and only in Italy. So in a recent study in 2009, Fadini 
that he is the director of from Ronza, from Forer del Canto, it's, it's, it's the chief embryologist. Actually, in 2011, actually, he obtained a very nice of 27.3% of clinical pregnancy rate and the 22.7% delivery rate from, from a, a 100 a IVM cycle. But the only difference that was from this study is that he used three days, day two, three, and four of natural, of a normal cycle of 150 milligram of FSH, and he induced actually ovulation, let's say, or, or just before retrieval, he used HCG 10,000 units. So if I can summarize, in women with normal ovaries, the IVM protocol it could be an alternative to conventional IVF, obtaining comparable pregnancy rate. It removes the side effects of drug stimulation, especially ovarian hyperstimulation. And it reduces the cost of the entire procedure, both in terms of time consumption, a patient's or society cost for drugs, and definitely, as was mentioned by the previous speaker, reduce psychological impact. What about PCOS patients? And this is mainly the, the, the biggest group. Again, you can see something very interesting. And this is quite a learning curve because looking from 2000, CHA, that was the first one in, in, in Montreal that performed, that has a 27% pregnancy rate, more or less during 2000, 2001, 2005, the pregnancy rate were more or less the same. In my group that we performed in 2011, we have about 28% of pregnancy rate, but there are some, some inconsistency between the protocols between the groups because are some authors that are describing IVF just absolutely without any other kind of, of, of stimulation, I mean not two or three days of FSH stimulation, and other that are prescribing two or two, three days a low amount of gonadotropin and inducing so-called ovulation or prescribing HCG between, before retrieval. But looking a little bit farther, and you can see in 2011, Enad Paz, that she's one of, of, my, of my seniors in my department, when she was working in Montreal, she obtained a 43% pregnancy rate. And if we look to this, to this interesting study, you can see that in pure IVF, in pure IVF, she had about 30% delivery rate with a with a, a very, very, very nice percentage of 40% in the standard IVM. But again, they use, this Canadian group, use three days of giving 150 units of recombinant, recombinant FSH and again giving 10,000 HCG. But what was even more important, looking 2012, the last article you can see, this is the Grimaud, again past 2012, and this very nice group from China, they obtained a very, very, very nice pregnancy rate, 44%, and 38% with about 30% delivery rate using the same protocol that I, that I mentioned before. And this is very important, maybe the last, the, uh, this, uh, this three, uh, this three publication, those three publications. So, and this is a very nice paper again by, by, by Shalom Paz, that describe, you know, the increased rate of pregnancy rate, implantation rate, and life birth rate during the years. You see, 2005, 2006, 2000, and so on, and so on, with an excellent, excellent clinical pregnancy rate, up to 50% in 2009, demonstrating that, you know, when you're starting to use a new technique, definitely it is a learning curve that should be applied until you'll get your, your best results. And this is one of the, not the last one, but just before last publication, and it comes from Stefan Jung from Australia, improving plantation and ongoing pregnancy rate after a single embryo transfer, blastocyst, which an optimized protocol for in vitro maturation in women with PCO. And this group obtained, you can see, again, re replacing only one embryo, one blastocyst, 44% clinical pregnancy rate. 
and 44% live birth rate. It means it even has no abortion. That is amazing. And this was what was published in 2012 and fertility and sterility. But, and here is starting the question. And the question was raised by Dominic Ziegler in 2012 in a reflection saying, listen, we are now in a new area. We are in an area where we are prescribing an antagonist protocol with an agonist a trigger of, of ovulation, and we do not have OHSS. So why to do it? Maybe OHS, maybe IVM, it's not for use anymore. We do not need anymore. But read, reading carefully this, this article, he actually described publication from 2001, 2005, when the results indeed were very low. So results were improved today, as I just showed. He looked to generate agonist trigger to control the risk of OHSS, but higher pregnancy losses were observed during this protocol, but to my mind. And even the try, you know, to, to add, to back add to this protocol, to back add GNRH to a dual trigger, that it means to add back a, some 1,500 units of HCG at the day of the GNRH agonist, had about 2.9% of OHSS. So, and looking to the latest article, latest article, human reproduction that just a month ago was published, two months ago, of, of again of Humayden, and actually it was a very nice prospe a prospective randomized study looking to, and comparing, you see, 60 to, to 60 patients, one group having GNRH agonist trigger with 100, 1,500 HCG and without triggering. And he described 0% OHSS, impressively. But again, looking properly, looking properly in the group, at the day of triggering, the estradiol level was between four to 10,000 picomol. That is quite low level, they are quite low level. Of course, in such a level, you cannot expect to obtain OHSS. We are talking about patients that in, in the day of HCG administration or whatever will be, may have higher level, level that are over 3,400 picogram, not picomol. So again, we have to look very, very, very carefully to what we are reading. And this is the, the last report, last report that came from, from VTEC, it is a group for, for Robbins, this group from Robbins is from, from um, near Boston, from, from Connecticut, doesn't matter. And he looked and he described a very new type of, of protocol, just giving estrogens from the day two of the cycle, so suppressing the FSH. Actually, it is the real IVM protocol. And he retrieved the eggs according to, he retrieved the follicle, giving the HCG when the, 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 the thickness of the endometrium was over six millimeters. And look here, he obtained clinical pregnancy rate 40%, life birth rate 40%. That's it, amazing. There are amazing results. And again, I was in this unit. We also started to use this kind of protocol that will be presented maybe in next convention. So this is our paper, our work that was just uh, accepted now. IVM protocol, and we compare retrospectively with a GNRH agonist protocol. We have 61 cases IVM, 53 uh, uh, antagonist protocol. You see all the, the characteristics were the same. You see the follicular phase definitely was a little bit, was longer in the antagonist number of the follicle in, uh, up to 10 millimeters were very high in the IVM protocol. There were PCO patients. All the patients were, in, uh, were PCO. Endometrial thickness were a little bit higher after the antagonist protocol. But what is important, we retrieve about um, 
about 12 to 13 age, uh, eggs in the IVM. Eight eggs were mature in vitro, 60% fertilization rate. And we obtained a 35% pregnancy rate and 23% life birth rate, absolutely comparable with the antagonist protocol performed for PCO, uh, PCO patients in, in, our, in our department. So if I summarize, IVM for women with PCOS, it could be economical, it's simple, puncture is simple and safe, and can improve even the disrupt endocrine environment and induce spontaneous recovery in ovulation, and it can avoid short-term complications such as OHSS, but also long-term complications such as hormone-dependent neoplasm, including breast and ovarian cancer, implantation, pregnancy, and delivery rate obtained in certain institutes are well comparable with standard IVF. What about fertility preservation? And I think that fertility preservation, it's a must. This kind of protocol should be a must. Because the emerging technology of IVM, of oocytes and oocyte retrieval, had become another option of fertility preservation. And you know that we can freeze pieces of cortex and we can freeze all over and so on, but this procedure could be done without any hormonal stimulation and, and any time. If you can see, for instance, in this work of Maman, Man, uh, Maman she actually retrieved just immediately oocytes in the luteal phase and compare with the retrieval in follicular phase, and actually there were no difference in the, the number of oocytes retrieved M2 oocytes that were obtained after in vitro maturation, maturation rate, fertilization rate, and oocytes that were cryopreserved in women with neoplasm. And this is our results that also we had uh, patients that we actually uh, uh, mature breast CA, endometrial CA, endometrial CA, that actually we have immediately to start and to retrieve eggs before starting chemotherapy. So in conclusion, the strategy of IVM without increasing serum estradiol level and delay cancer treatment represent a state-of-the-art modality for fertility preservation. What about the children? If you are giving, prescribing a new treatment, we have to be aware if there are no complications. 2011, in a, it's a book that Cha, again from, from Montreal, read, 2,000 healthy infants had been born following immature oocytes retrieval for IVM. And this is a very nice study from Canada, from Bucket, that again, 432 babies compared with 1,296 H and parity match controls born for spontaneous pregnancy, and there were actually, between IVM, IVF, ICSI, actually no differences in any kind of short or long-term complication in the newborns. And this is the last study published by Fadini, a retrospective study, 196 babies from IVF, for IVM, compare 194 children from COS ICSI, performed during the same period of time. The age of the delivery was comparable. In single births, major and minor abnormalities were absolutely the same, 1.4, 4.2. 1% in the ICSI group and 0% and 5.2% in the IVM category, respectively. So in conclusion, studies to date do not identify any alarming rate of congenital anomalies in IVM children, and studies which had followed up children up to the age of two have been provided reassuring results regarding their growth and development. I know that IVM is not ready as a treatment, and they have many problems, some of them epigenetics. There are epigenetic modifications necessary for normal development that are established during oocyte growth that maybe we can intervene with this epigenetic modification. The capability of reprogramming the male chromatin after fertilization could depend on oocyte maturation, and maybe we can actually disturb this capability in IVM. IVM oocytes are more, li more likely to have abnormal chromosomal configuration and disorganized, disorganized meiotic spindle microtubules, as was uh, published in 2006. It's possible, but what about conventional IVF? 
And this is actually, maybe you know, this is Louise Brown. This is his first tube baby. I know her personally from Cambridge. <laughs> I was working in Cambridge about 20, 20 years ago. I am worried about IVF moms being pumped full of hormones. And looking in the res recent years in the literature, it has become evident that ovarian stimulation, also a central component in IVF, may itself have detrimental effect on organesis, embryo quality, endometrioceptiveness, and perhaps also prenatal outcome. And this is a very nice article for, for uh, 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 Margarita Dos Santos, but also Nick McClone, that, that previous speaker talked about him. And look what they found, detrimental effect of supraphysiological estradiol levels on all seed quality or endometrial receptive. So this is what we are doing. It's not always very, very, very sure. So what about physiological impact? It's also my previous lecture told about reducing the psychological impact with natural cycle or modify natural cycle. So again, in IVM, you have no psychological impact, mostly at all. So in conclusion, IVF, IVM produces about 35 clinical pregnancy rate in young women, comparable with IVF in many programs. Obstetric and perinatal outcome are, are comparable. IVM holds great promises as an alternative to standard assisted reproductive technology and may be the procedure of choice for obtaining all seeds for donation or fertility preservation. However, standardization of protocol in patients with different, different etiology are needed. And as Edwards say, I see IVM as an all-round and cheaper solution this is really a new area for IVF in certain cases. It looks very promising. Definitely, it is a time for everything. This is my group, and I want to thank to my group of, of patients and just to thank you for your attention. Thank you.